The title of our sermon this morning is That You May Believe, That You May Believe. As we consider that title, we understand that that's the purpose for John's writing the Gospel of John. John has said that he's written these things that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So once again in John chapter 19, this text from verses 31 to 42, it's our solemn joy uh, once again to come to this historic, historical narrative and to the foot of the cross, right, to consider the events and circumstances that attend the death and now the burial of our Lord Jesus Christ in verses 31 through 42. So having looked now closely at the events in verses 31 to 37, last Lord's Day, the Lord has been crucified. He has been hung on a Roman cross to die like a common criminal. In verse 30, he bows his head, breathes his last, and he gives up his spirit. In verse 33, they came to Jesus, and they affirmed that he was already dead. In verse 34, he is brutally pierced with a spear, and immediately blood and water flows from his side. The Lord Jesus Christ has died. So the irrational hatred then, the mockery, of the Jews against Jesus has finally subsided somewhat. The wicked contempt shown toward him and the brutality of the soldiers has finally ended. Pilate returns to his business, having successfully quelled a potential uprising. The crowd disperses. They go back to prepare for their Sabbath observance. They go back to their quote-unquote worship of God. The world has murdered the Messiah, a bright but momentary flame has been snuffed out. To them, yet another fool, peddling delusions of grandeur, is put in the ground like all the rest. And Christianity has ended as, about as quickly as it began, just another blip on the timeline of, timeline of history, soon to be forgotten. Is that the way it worked out? <laughs> Not hardly, right? Turn with me to Acts chapter 5, a few pages to the right, Acts chapter 5. Not hardly. That's the way the world wanted it to work out. That's the way that Satan had intended for it to work out. Is that the way it worked out? Not hardly. The world has murdered the Messiah, but we know from Scripture that God has delivered him up. And he delivered him up for us all. That sinners might be saved. Acts chapter 5, drop down to verse 26. It won't be long... Before we find in Acts chapter 5 that the apostles are found preaching on Solomon's porch that Jesus is the Christ. The high priest, the Sadducees are enraged over this. So they seize the apostles, they throw them in prison, an angel miraculously frees them, and they're right back in the temple teaching the people that Jesus is the Christ. In verse 26, then the captain went with the officers, brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they should be stoned. They murdered the Messiah, but they feared the people as they should be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man's blood, the Lord Jesus Christ, you intend to bring this man's blood on us? But Peter, the other apostles, answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. And when they heard this, these hypocritical, murderous Jews were furious. And what did they do? Verse 33, they plotted to kill them. Just like they had murdered the Messiah, they plotted to kill them. Verse 34, then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people, and he commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. He wanted to talk some reason to these Pharisees. Verse 35, he said to them, Men of Israel, 
Take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. That's what happened at the death of Feudus. Verse 37, after this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, and Judas drew away many people after him. He also perished, and what happened when Judas perished? All who obeyed him were dispersed, and Judas came to nothing. Verse 38, now I say to you, keep away from these men, let them alone. Jesus Christ is dead, right? Keep away from these men. Leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Now, Gamaliel was right. If that were of men, it would have come to nothing. If that were all that it was, if Jesus Christ was a mere man, he would have died on the tree, they would have put him in the ground, and that would have been it. It would have been over. But this plan, this work, the perfect life of Christ, the perfect death of Christ, the perfect bodily resurrection of Christ is of God, and man cannot overthrow it. Look at verse 40. They agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing. I'm struck by that every time I read it, right? They departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily, daily in the temple... And in every house, notice the emphasis, right? Daily in the temple, every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Now that's the history of Christianity, right? That's the, that's the result of the Lord's work. That's the prosperity of the gospel. That's the preaching of the gospel. Christianity didn't die with the death of Jesus Christ. It prospered. And how did it prosper? It prospered through by the means of the faith of God's people following our Lord. That mustard seed, right? That mustard seed that the Lord Jesus Christ speaks about in Matthew 13. Far from being stamped out, that mustard seed is growing. And it's growing. And it's growing. It's growing into a great tree. Jesus Christ is building his church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. However, that hasn't happened apart from the persecution and death of those who follow the Lord. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Soon after this event in Acts chapter 5, Stephen... The first to die after Christ is a martyr stoned to death in Acts chapter 7 for preaching the gospel. Peter, crucified upside down for his faith. John, died in exile for the faith. Andrew, crucified for the faith. Matthew, was flayed for the faith. Paul, beheaded for the faith. James, stoned and clubbed. The list goes on and on and on. And it carries on and on and on to this day. So far from being over, right? Far from being over at the death of Christ on the cross, the irrational hatred and the mockery continues. To the present day, the wicked contempt and brutality that we saw in those soldiers continues. Get used to it. Chalk it up. That's the way it's going to be, right? The world's antagonism towards Christ, towards Christians, hasn't subsided. In fact, it grows worse and grows worse and grows worse. Now, all of that is directed at the Lord's people. At Revelation 17, in Revelation 17 at the end, the whore of Babylon is described as drunk with the blood of the saints. 
And these are those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Turn with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. The Lord has told us this beforehand. And through this, the Lord wants to bolster our faith for the mission that lies before us. A new generation of torchbearers for Christ. A new generation of witnesses for Christ. Look at John chapter 15. And look beginning at verse 18. The Lord says there, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word... They will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Now this is important for disciples of Christ to understand. It's important for us to understand this. This is the Lord's teaching to us. Why? We need faith. We need faith if we are to persevere through persecution. You must exercise faith to persevere. He tells us ahead of time what's going to happen so that when it comes to pass, we will trust in him. Look at chapter 16 at verse 1. These things I have spoken to you. Why? Why? That you should not be made to stumble. They're going to put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God's service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But listen, verse 4. These things I have told you so that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. Have you noticed often in the scripture that many times a prophecy is obscure until its fulfillment when it becomes crystal clear, right? Right? You look back at a prophecy, it may have been obscure to those people at that particular time, but then you see its fulfillment, and that prophecy becomes crystal clear. And it has the, the impact, the effect of building our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly what's going on here with the disciples in John chapter 15, John chapter 16. And now, in light of the cross, we see these things even more clearly. We're to see the fulfillment. We're to see the truth of what the Lord Jesus Christ has said. We're to connect what happens to that fulfillment, right? We're to connect our circumstances to the fulfillment of what the Lord Jesus Christ has said. And then we are to exercise faith in light of that glorious truth and follow him in faith. You see? We're to follow him in faith. Exercise faith. Speaking to the disciples about going back to the Father by means of his own death, Jesus says in John chapter 14, verse 29, and now I have told you before it comes so that when it does come to pass, you may believe. You may believe. Now believe what exactly? Believe what? Just some historical facts? You know? Believe that God can predict the future. Is that what we're to believe? Certainly, we're to believe historical facts. Certainly, we believe that God can predict the future. But we are to believe Christ. We're to believe his person. We're to believe his work. We're to believe his commandments. We're to believe his mission. We're to believe what he has called us to do. And we're to believe that he is with us, lo, even to the end of the age. We're to believe Christ. We're to believe him. Like our brothers and sisters who went before us, who went to the stake for their faith. We're to believe him like that. We're to trust him when he warns of judgment. We're to fear him when he warns of apostasy. We're to obey him when he gives commands. We're to look forward to the hope of his coming because he has said he is coming back again. And we're to commit ourselves to preaching the gospel, believing what he has told us. What he has described is going to happen. And there are many today, many today in professed Christianity who have no interest in preaching the gospel. 
right? They'd rather sit at home with a book, maybe listen to a sermon or two on the road. You know, they call themselves Christians because they get together in a nice gathering on a Sunday morning with a bunch of people they superficially know, and they pretend to worship. But what is the Lord Jesus Christ calling us to? He's calling us to follow him. We are to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, learning followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, following him in what he did, preaching the gospel. If you're not following him, you are not a Christian. You're not a disciple. Listen, our text in John chapter 19, verses 31 to 42, our text through the pen of John here is to fire up our faith. These are things that God has said would come to pass. We see them now as having come to pass. Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of these things, and now we are to follow him. Right? We are to follow him. We are to believe in him, put our faith in him, and follow him. At this time, at this time, at the cross in the first century, when all must have appeared to the disciples to have been lost, right? Their hopes dashed, expectations unfulfilled. Their Messiah is dead. At that time and through these events, the Lord builds and supercharges our faith by pointing us back to the fact that this is exactly what God said would happen. This is exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ said would have happened. And not just so that we would be in awe and in wonder over the fact that God can perfectly predict the future, but to reinforce our faith in the God that sovereignly controls all things and rules and reigns over you and over me. In John chapter 19, verses 31 to 42, John records in his account of the death of Christ here powerful encouragements to faith. Powerful encouragements to faith. And listen, faith is something you exercise. It's not just a set of facts that you believe in. Certainly it's that. But faith is something that you exercise. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you believe that he is the Son of God, then you believe that he died to save sinners. And you believe what he says about the preaching of that gospel to the lost. And you believe that he will save sinners to himself, that he's expanding his kingdom on this earth, that his church will be built. It, the, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. His kingdom will come to fruition. Jesus Christ will come back. He will set up his kingdom on earth. You believe those things, and you're about that business. You're about that work. He died in fulfillment of thousands of years of Scripture. He affirmed that he is the Son of God. He has been raised from the dead. He is coming back again, and we're to follow him. When it appears as though all is lost, when it appears as though Satan and this world have prevailed when you're tempted to discouragement in the work of evangelism. When you're tempted to shrink back from that work because of fear. When you fail in faithfulness and you find yourself cold or apathetic to the cause. When you think you're too busy or you're too tired or you're too old or you're too young, remember your first love. Remember what he endured for you. Remember that he told you all this beforehand. This is not our home. Persevere in faithfulness to him. Persevere in preaching the gospel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in and persevere until he comes back. All these things were told you beforehand so that when they do come to pass, you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The last Lord's Day, point one on your notes, we looked at verses 31 to 37 and how John intended to cultivate our faith through the testimony of the scriptures, both Old Testament and New Testament. Not one bone in his body is broken and not one promise in his book is broken. Today, point two on your notes, we're going to consider verses 38 through 42 and the testimony of his disciples. The testimony of his disciples. John chapter 19, verse 38. It's late afternoon. 
on Friday, the day of preparation preceding the Sabbath. The Lord has died. He's bowed his head, he's yielded up his spirit, breathed his last. Not a bone of his body was broken in fulfillment of Scripture. A Roman soldier has pierced his side in fulfillment of Scripture. And he now hangs lifeless on the tree. Verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was nearby. I want us to consider in verses 38 through 42 in the testimony of his disciples, I want us to consider this under three headings. One, the testimony of Joseph. Two, the testimony of Nicodemus. And three, the testimony of Isaiah. The testimony of Joseph, the testimony of Nicodemus, and the testimony of Isaiah. First, beginning in verse 38, the testimony of Joseph. Verse 38 begins after this, after the death of Christ, right? After the, the events of verses 31 through 37, here after this draws our attention to a new subject, draws our attention to a transition. And here specifically, the new subject of our text is the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. And so he came and took the body of Jesus. After death by crucifixion, the Romans ordinarily would leave criminals on the cross until their bodies decayed and rotted. Anyone passing that way would have seen those rotting corpses as an example of what happens to those who violate Roman, Roman law. The Latin poet Horace referred to crucified slaves feeding the crows on their crosses. Whatever was left after all this would end up in an unmarked pit, either an unmarked pit or on the garbage heap of Gehenna. Gehenna was the city garbage dump southwest of Jerusalem. And in Gehenna is also called the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom was where the Israelites burned their children to death as sacrifices to the pagan god Moloch. And Gehenna now a garbage dump fitting for that place. And in Gehenna, there was a continuous burning of trash, a burning of debris, a, a burning of the stuff that went in there to keep disease out of the city. It was an utterly despicable and disgusting place. The word Gehenna used by Christ is a picture of hell. It was a place where the, the maggot never dies and the fire is never quenched. If you think about that, right? Gehenna being a picture of hell, Gehenna being a garbage dump. What eventually happens to those who are cursed of God without hope in this world and apart from Christ? What happens to those who rebel against Him, who reject Christ? who do not repent, do not turn from their sin, do not put their faith and trust in Christ, they are cast upon the cosmic garbage heap of the universe, God's garbage heap where the maggot never dies and the fire is never quenched. Where there, as the Lord says, is weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's where people go. That's hell. That's hell. But according to verse 38, there was a man who wanted to see that the Lord Jesus Christ was properly buried. This man is Joseph of Arimathea. Prior to this, Joseph of Arimathea is unknown. We know that he's a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, the council. We know that he's a wealthy man. And he is here mentioned by all four gospel writers honoring the Lord at his burial. Now, I want you to notice in the testimony of Joseph, three important facts concerning Joseph of Arimathea. First fact is this. Joseph was converted. Joseph was a saved man. 
Look at verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus. Now, John describes him as a disciple. Matthew affirms that he had become a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 15, verse 43. Mark mentions that he was himself waiting for the kingdom of God. Luke chapter 23, verse 50. Luke describes Joseph as a good and a just man. What is a disciple? Again, a disciple of Jesus. A disciple is a learning follower. Not just a learner, right? A learning follower, an apprentice, so to speak. Taught by the Lord. Obediently following the Lord. Doing what the Lord calls them to do. Not just a learner, but a learning follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's obvious from the gospel records. Obvious from the gospel records, gospel accounts, that Joseph loved the Lord. Here we see Joseph loving the Lord Jesus Christ by seeing to his burial. And Joseph here steps out at great risk to himself and follows the Lord. It appears as though Joseph was converted. But next, Joseph was concealed. Joseph was concealed. Look at verse 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of of the Jews. And this statement <clears throat> has led to some confusion about Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea is a bit of an enigma in the scriptures because of this type of statement or this statement that's made here in verse 38 about him. This statement has often led many to conclude that Joseph was a coward and that Joseph wasn't a genuine disciple because he was a coward or that he was, uh, as some would say, that he was a secret disciple, a cowardly disciple, and yet still a disciple. There are those that would say that. There are some that would say that Joseph was not a disciple. Here at the death of Christ, he became a disciple. What do we know? We know that verse 38 says that he's a disciple. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all present him as a disciple. But often, Joseph is lumped together with those rulers in John chapter 12 who wouldn't confess Christ because of their fear of the Pharisees. Turn back to John chapter 12 with me. John chapter 12. And look with me at beginning at verse 42. This is John chapter 12, verse 42. Now we know, here's one thing we know. There's no such thing as a secret disciple. When we're talking about genuine faith, a genuine disciple, there is no such thing as a secret, genuine disciple. A genuine disciple is a witness for Christ. The righteous are as bold as a lion. John chapter 12, look at verse 42. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him... But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. And right? if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, right? That Jesus is the Christ. They did not confess him lest they should put, be put out of the synagogue. Now why? Verse 43. Because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. These aren't disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it says in verse 42, they believed in him. But it says in verse 43, the condition of their heart. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now this type of believer was introduced to us back in John chapter 2. Turn back to John chapter 2 with me. And we've seen this, if you've been with us, as we've been walking verse by verse by verse through the gospel of John, <clears throat> you've seen these so-called believers throughout the gospel. Look at John chapter 2, verse 23. When the Lord was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, it says there, verse 23, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. 
Many believed in him because of the signs that they saw. We see that throughout the gospel, right? In John chapter 6, many followed the Lord Jesus Christ because of the signs that he did. He fed them in John chapter 6. Many multitudes followed after him. But at the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, many of them, John chapter 6, turned and followed him no more. Were they disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ? No. No. Although it says they believed in him, they weren't genuine disciples. They did not follow him. John chapter 12, same statement. Many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they didn't confess him because they feared them. They were cowardly, so-called disciples. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God, and many want to lump Joseph of Arimathea in with this group of rulers and deceived disciples. This group of rulers and these false professing believers. Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. John would write later of this. The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, Sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Look at the company of cowards, unbelievers, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and liars. That list headed by cowards. We are to fear God more than fear man. Amen? Those who put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is the, the essence of faith to fear God. It's the essence of our faith to trust him so that when we follow him, we fear God more than we fear man. Right? Didn't Peter say, we ought to obey God rather than obey man. That fear which keeps you from obedience to the Lord is a sinful fear. That's a fear that esteems men more than esteems God. It's a fear that needs to be repented of. Calls for your repentance. Now all this, all this, right, doesn't seem to fit with what we see in the gospel regarding Joseph. It just doesn't fit together. To lump him in with that group doesn't seem characteristic here at all of Joseph. The Greek verbal in verse 38 that's translated secretly is actually a passive participle. Now follow with, follow with me on this. It's translated as, a, as an adverb here in the English. It's actually a passive participle. That passive means that Joseph was being concealed. It means that Joseph was being concealed. He was protected. He was hidden until this point. Now maybe hidden by others, hidden by God until this very time and for this very purpose where he would attend to the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. As we'll see, Joseph in doing this fulfills scripture, but nevertheless Joseph was being concealed for fear of the Jews. Now there's fear associated there. It's possible that Joseph had taken a stand for Christ and likely he and others thought that now his life was in danger. We know that God hid Elijah, right? In 1 Kings 17, God hid Paul. Jesus hid himself on occasion. It's possible here that God hid Joseph. Whatever the case, whatever the case, Joseph now is concealed no longer. Whatever fear had once prompted his concealment, Joseph has been struck by the Lord's death. Looking on him who was pierced, Joseph has been struck by the Lord's death, and Joseph now steps out boldly, out of the darkness, so, so to speak, and Joseph takes action. Joseph was converted, Joseph was concealed, but Joseph was courageous. Joseph was courageous. Joseph doesn't appear here to be a coward at all. Having looked on him whom they pierced, Joseph casts off caution at this point in the gospel, and in verse 38, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, goes to Pilate. He goes to Pilate and asks Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Mark chapter 15, verse 43, describes Joseph as coming and taking courage there, if you have the New King James. And that word 
For courage means boldly. It means boldly. Joseph, coming boldly with boldness, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Luke chapter 23, verse 51. Luke adds that Joseph was a council member and that Joseph had not consented to the decision of the Jews and to their deed. If you remember when we were in John chapter 18, we were looking at the mock trial of the Lord Jesus Christ. That mock trial, it says there that all consented to his death. Here, John chapter 19, we see that, that Joseph of Arimathea did not consent to his death. It would likely mean that Joseph wasn't even present, that he abstained from that whole thing. And maybe for fear of the Jews, out of concern for his own life, but Joseph here is described as one who took a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and had not consented to the decision of the Jews and to their deed. In other words, Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, had taken a stand for Christ during his trial, refused to cast his vote with the others to judge Christ guilty, rejected their plot to have him killed. He did not consent. He wouldn't go along. He stood firm for the sake of Christ. Jo Joseph doesn't appear to be cowardly. Verse 38 then ends with the fact that Pilate gave him permission. So Joseph came and he took the body of Jesus Christ. That's the testimony of Joseph. Next in verse 39, we see the testimony of Nicodemus. The testimony of Nicodemus. Verse 39. Nicodemus who at first came to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. The, the fearful circumstances surrounding the ministry, the life, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ are highlighted once again here by John's description of Nicodemus in verse 39 as the one who at first came to Jesus by night. Now this, of course, is a reference to John chapter 3 where we are first introduced to Nicodemus. And John describes him as a man of the Pharisees and a ruler of the Jews. It may have been that Nicodemus first came to Christ by night to get some answers. He didn't yet fully understand who Christ is. He certainly wasn't ready to take a stand and antagonize his fellow Pharisees. But in John chapter 3, Nicodemus comes. Turn back to John chapter 3 with me. John chapter 3. Just prior to this, in John chapter 2, we have the text that we just looked at. There were many of those who believed in his name when they saw the signs that he did, and Jesus didn't commit himself to them. And then in chapter 3, verse 1, we see a man now of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who came. He was a ruler of the Jews. In verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. It's likely that Nicodemus, like Joseph, first came without understanding. When we went through the text in John chapter 3, we looked at Joseph's ignorance with respect to who Christ is and what Christ was there to do. So Nicodemus here asking questions, honest questions, wanting to know the truth, and the Lord Jesus Christ instructing. We know that in John chapter 7, verse 50, that Nicodemus' resolve is apparently strengthened and he takes a stand for Christ in exposing the irrational judgment of the Jews against him. The Jews wanted to kill him in John chapter 7. And Nicodemus stood up for the Lord there. And then we see him here, back in John chapter 19. Out from under the cover of night, in the light of day, so to speak, serving Christ at his burial. Nicodemus here is emboldened through faith. Now the love that Nicodemus has for the Lord is also apparent in verse 39, considering what he brings to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 39. Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. The Jews didn't embalm the body. They anointed the body before burial. So they wrapped the body in linen, and then as they were wrapping the body in linen, they poured spices on the body. And then as they were wrapping the body in linen, they would pour spices into the linen strips uh, that they wrapped the body with. Here, those spices referred to by John as myrrh and aloes. The intent of the spices, literally, to cover up the stench of the body, the stench of death as the body decayed and rotted in the tomb. 
However, here, if you consider verse 39, 100 pounds was a massive amount. Roman pounds is about 75, 72, 75 pounds that we're familiar with today, okay? A lot. To give you a reference, Josephus records that when the highly respected leader, Gamaliel, that we were introduced in, to in Acts 5, when Gamaliel was buried, they anointed his body with 40 pounds of spices. Here, Nicodemus brings 100 pounds of spices. It's an amount that would have been reserved for a king, and justly so, right? Now, incidentally, incidentally, you don't use that much, that costly of an amount of spices to anoint a body that you intend to steal. <laughs> you don't use that much to anoint someone in their burial that you believe is going to rise from the dead just a few short days from now. <laughs> if you're planning a resurrection, trying to plot make sure that it's going to happen and you're going to set up that ruse you're not going to spend that much and anoint the body with that much just another little evidence that Jesus Christ died and actually rose from the dead in verse 39, in verse 39 we have another example here in Nicodemus of a Jewish ruler a member of the ruling council the Sanhedrin motivated by the death of Christ to take a stand and give of both himself and and his possessions. Nicodemus went from John chapter 3 of being ignorant about the Lord Jesus Christ, just wanting to know, wanting to understand, wanting to ask questions, through John chapter 7 when we see his resolve strengthening, now to John chapter 19 where Nicodemus is a genuine disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, boldly coming out of the dark, right, out of the cover of night, so to speak, to serve the Lord at his burial. Verse 40, so then... Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, verse 40, took the body of Jesus. They bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now think with me for a moment about the testimony of these two men. Fearful circumstances for both of them. There's no hiding that. These are fearful circumstances. Jesus Christ has just been crucified. There is severe persecution, and the persecution is growing. Both of these men are members of the ruling Sanhedrin. Both are prominent, well-respected members, leaders of the people. Both Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have status. They have position. They have wealth. They have the respect of the people. They have comfort. They have all the leisures and pleasures that a life of wealth and comfort could provide. Sounds like us, doesn't it? <laughs> Being a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing the Lord Jesus Christ and following him, certainly following him in this way, not only meant the risk of losing their position on the Sanhedrin, but we know from John chapter 9 that it also meant excommunication from temple worship itself. They would risk losing everything by doing this, by following the Lord Jesus Christ, by confessing him. Joseph gives up his own tomb, no small amount. Nicodemus sacrificially gives up his own money, and they both give up whatever fear they once felt, and they boldly stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Upon the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ, they come to the point where they openly confess by their actions that nothing matters but Christ. The Sanhedrin certainly would have known that they did this. Certainly they would have known. But they both Joseph and Nicodemus at this point would have both attested that I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live but Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by faith in him 
right? The Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I who live. They risk everything. They may have thought to themselves, right, at the death of Christ, I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I've come to believe that he is the Messiah. I've come to believe that he is the Son of God. No one other than the Son of God could do what this man has done. How can I serve him? I know what I'll do. I've got a tomb just off the hill. I know what I'll do. I'll go to Pilate. The only other ones there were the women and John. They would have likely had no influence on Pilate with respect to that. But Joseph of Arimathea could. And so what did he do? He did. He took action. And Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate. What can I do? What can I do? I can give my money and I can buy a hundred pounds of spices and anoint the body of the Lord Jesus Christ to give him an honorable burial, to show my love for him. It's like Mary, right? Taking the costly ointment and breaking the alabaster jar and pouring out all that she had saved, pouring all that out on the Lord Jesus Christ to anoint him for his death. And here Nicodemus doing the same thing, boldly standing for the Lord. Consider the sacrifice, right? Consider the sacrifice of Christ and then consider your sacrifice. That's what Joseph of Arimathea did. That's what Nicodemus did. Jesus Christ died on the tree. And Joseph, Nicodemus, thinking to themselves, what can I do? What can I do? I want to serve the Lord. I love the Lord. What can I do? What can I do? If your job is keeping you from Christ, then your job isn't worth keeping. If that so-called friend is hindering you from giving everything to follow him, then that so-called friend isn't worth keeping. Good riddance to bad rubbish if they won't turn to Christ and follow him with you. If your mother, if your father, if your brother, if your sister, if your boss, your cousin, your BFF, your spouse... If any of them stand in your way, who are you going to love more? Who are you going to love more? After all that we know of the testimony of these two men, right? After all that we know of, of what Christ endured for sinners, are you willing, are you willing with them and with our brothers and sisters throughout history, are you willing to stare down Whatever fear you face and be a bold witness for Christ. Modern excuses, modern excuses for evangelism are pathetic. Modern excuses for lack of evangelism in a vast majority of churches today by a vast majority of professing Christians are pathetic. There are men and women who have burned alive being a witness for Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ endured such hostility at the hands of sinners so that you could fear a little opposition when you, right? Our excuses are sometimes so pathetic. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't, I don't want to offend. All I can do really is just pray for them. Certainly pray for them. That's the most important thing you can do. But then open your mouth in obedience to Christ. Share the gospel. Preach the gospel. You know, I really, I, I, I need to become their friend first. I need to work on them for a year and then earn the right to preach the gospel to them. Listen, that's nothing. That's nothing but a cowardly fear of man. Capitulating to our culture. Capitulating to weakness in our own fallen hearts. That's nothing but a cowardly fear of man. You may have been fearful once. You may be fearful now. You may be fearful now. But we must repent of our cowardice and preach Christ. We must not fear their faces. We must be more loving of their soul than we are concerned about the response we're going to get from them and preach the gospel 
The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The time is coming, all right? The time is coming where you may lose your job because you refuse to call George Sally and affirm George in his sin. Right, brother? Don't hold on to the things of this world too tightly. John the Baptist lost his head because he stood up to Herod and he said, it was unlawful for you to have that woman as your wife. Right? Let go of all of that. Stop worrying. Give it all up. Stop fearing. And let's trust Christ. He gives us these examples as powerful inducements for our faith, as powerful encouragements for our faith. We're to trust him and obey him, preaching the gospel. We've got a mission. He's given us the great commission. We're to go to work for him in that until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and his kingdom is ushered in with it. We've considered the testimony of Joseph. We've considered the testimony of Nicodemus. Lastly, consider with me the testimony of Isaiah. Again, John intends all of this to encourage and to build up our faith. Look at verse 41. John chapter 19, verse 41. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there, they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day. For the tomb was nearby. Now, verse 41, the place where he was crucified is, of course, course, Golgotha, the place of the skull. We know that Golgotha was not only the place where Jesus was crucified, but Golgotha was also the place where many Many criminals were crucified. In fact, Jesus himself crucified between two criminals. In immediate proximity to where criminals were crucified was the place where those same criminals were ultimately buried. And John records that it was in a garden on the hill. John describes in verse 41 the the tomb as new that no one had yet been laid at that tomb. And it it recalls to mind the work of the priest in Leviticus chapter 6. You want to look at that on your own? Leviticus chapter 6, verse 11. The priest would carry the ashes of the burnt offering outside the camp to a clean place. And here was a tomb outside the camp in which no one had yet been laid. Tomb was clean. Tomb was unused. It was pure. And it would remain that way. It would remain that way because according to the scriptures, the Lord Jesus' body, his flesh, will not see corruption. Now we know from Matthew chapter 27, verse 60, that this tomb, this garden tomb, near the place of execution, belonged to Joseph himself. It belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. According to verse 42, divine fulfillment at work in the fulfillment of scripture, divine providence... And all that meant to encourage our faith. This is God at work in the fulfillment of Scripture, even in the death and the details around the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ, all meant to encourage our faith. God's providence, verse 42, had ensured that a rich man owned a tomb nearby the place of execution so that in the three hours that existed between the time that the the Lord Jesus Christ died and the evening of the Sabbath, when the day would turn and the Sabbath would be upon them, in that period of time, the Lord's body could be anointed and it could be put into the tomb. Verse 42, so there, in fulfillment of Scripture, they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. Look with me at Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. And again, the sovereignty of God at work, even in the burial details of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah chapter 53. Remember that Isaiah, written 700 years before the time of Christ. It's like we talked about at the beginning, that these fulfillments maybe would have been obscure to those folks at that time, but now become crystal clear in their fulfillment. And we hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ echoing in our head with that. Listen, I told you beforehand, I told you beforehand, so when these things come to pass, you may know that I told you. 
You may have faith in him. Look at verse 4. Surely the Lord Jesus Christ has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. Verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now notice in verse 9, the word wicked there is plural. It's plural. They made his grave with the wicked people, with wicked criminals, with the wicked, plural. They made his grave with a plurality of wicked people. He was crucified and buried with criminals. Buried in a place where there would have been many criminals buried. Buried near the place of execution. Even in his burial, right, the Lord Jesus Christ associated or identified with the wicked. Although, verse 9 says, he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. He was identified with the wicked in order to save wicked sinners like you and me, right? However, the word rich, look at verse 9 again, the word rich is singular. A better translation would be, but with the rich man at his death. And here we know that to be Joseph, a member of the Sanhedrin, an honorable man, an esteemed man. Most of those who died at Golgotha would have been thrown into a nameless hole, tossed in Gehenna, but not Christ. Not Christ. Why? This prophecy. This prophecy, this prophecy, the Lord's sovereignly at work. Joseph of Arimathea, a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, would have a tomb in that very place, in that garden, on that hill at that time. From his sacrificial death on the cross to his resurrection from the dead, right down to the smallest details regarding his burial. God is in sovereign control and the Lord Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the scriptures. That should embolden us, amen? As we close, I want to give you one more thought to consider regarding the burial of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give that to you from Matthew chapter 27. Look at Matthew chapter 27 with me. Lord Jesus Christ, having died, now buried. Buried amongst the wicked with a rich man at his death. And now our eyes and our attention turn to his resurrection. Look at Matthew chapter 27 and drop down to verse 62. On the next day, which followed the day of preparation... This is on the Sabbath, right? This is on the Sabbath where these events take place. The chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together to Pilate, saying, verse 63, Sir, we remember while he was still alive how that deceiver said, After three days I will rise. Now to the Jews, any part of one day was considered a day, was counted as a day. Therefore, as they understood it, Jesus was buried on Friday, day one. He was in the tomb all day on Saturday, day two. He was in the tomb the morning of Sunday, the Lord's day, day three. And he rose again on the Lord's day. And the first fruits of all those who would rise again in him. Verse 64. Therefore... Understanding that he said these things in verse 63. Therefore, verse 64, the command that the tomb 
uh, be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead. So the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, verse 65, you have a guard, go your way, make it as secure as you know how. And so they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. All for naught. <laughs> the Lord Jesus Christ rises on the third day. And we look forward to looking at that in John chapter 20, beginning next week. All glory, all honor, majesty, dominion, praise, and blessing be to the one who died for our sins according to the scriptures. And he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Amen. Amen. Let's take a few moments in silent prayer as we consider the Lord's instruction here from John chapter 19, verses 31 through 42. Let's pray.